Hello, hello, everybody. Hi, it's good to see everyone today. I'm gonna give you all a minute to get connected. Sorry for the delay. We are so glad that you're patient and you joined us for our last in our four part series of our book club on ending Parkinson's disease. I'm very excited to have Bass Bloom with us today, Dr. Bloom, and I'm gonna introduce him in a minute, but first I wanna just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this is a book club, so it's interactive. So um, he is gonna have a presentation at the very beginning to talk over some key points, um, but he wants you to ask your questions. So you're welcome to either chat your question or you can raise your hand by using the um, little uh, reactions at the bottom and let us know that you have a question and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Um, so real quickly, just for those of you who may be a little more newer at using Zoom, if you might see some transcription at the bottom, if you like that, you can move that around your screen. If it's distracting, you can close it out. If you go to where it says live transcription and you click on that box, you can hide those subtitles. Click the chat box, open that up. That's where you can chat any of your questions and maybe give us a shout out. Let us know where you're all joining us from because we have Dr. Bloom from the Netherlands. So he is joining us from uh, clear across the pond and we're excited to have him. So I'm gonna introduce him so I can give him plenty of time to cover all of the material that he has. For those of you who may not be familiar with Dr. Bloom, he is a consulting neurologist in the Department of Neurology at Radboud University in the Netherlands. He is a founder and medical director of the Parkinson's Center in, Nijme in Nijmegen, which is recognized as a center of excellence. And he, along with Mark Martin Munich developed Parkinson Net, which is this innovative network of professionals that help Parkinson's patients all across Netherlands. He's widely published and one of the four of the uh, authors for ending Parkinson's disease. So he's joining us today for this last book club discussion. And I'm going to pass this off to you, Dr. Bloom. Well, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, and uh, to join you folks at the other end of the pond. Um, I prepared a brief slide presentation. Uh, you can interrupt me at any time, um, either unmute and just shout uh, or uh, try to put it in the chat. Uh, we'll have ample time for discussion, but I'll uh, share my screen first. Let's see if that works. So can you guys see this? And if I go full screen, can you still see it? Yeah, okay, good. The future is good. there. Okay, good. So just a quick thing. What I always keep telling people, is Parkinson's disease a condition that matters? And it absolutely does. And I know I'm reiterating what Ray Dorsey said, but this cannot be emphasized enough. Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing neurological condition in the world. Um, and this is disconcerting because of the numbers, because it can be a highly debilitating disease. It's a treatable disease, but many people don't receive the treatment they deserve. And it is probably, at least to an extent, a preventable disease. We increasingly feel that at least to an extent, Parkinson's is a man-made disease, just like the pyramids in Egypt, created by man, still standing strong. Parkinson's may be related to environmental pollution, uh, in addition to genetic factors, uh, but we feel that the environment plays a big role. And just to remind you that James Parkinson described the disease for the first time in 1817, when of course London was having uh, its industrial revolution and air pollution was taking uh, monstrous shapes. A series of very recent papers, including one only last week, showed that air pollution today is still contributing to the risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, of course, horrific now in China. This is 2021 China, where the disease is now exploding. Uh, the disease has doubled in the last 10 years in China. So uh, pollution is, a, is an issue. Pesticides is an issue. Trichloroethylene is an issue. Heavy metals uh, um, 
uh, is a concern. Head trauma is a concern. Particular diets, including regular dairy use, even though we don't know exactly how it works. But just to remind you, there are also protective factors, regular exercise, a Mediterranean diet, a few cups of coffee uh, are probably helpful in preventing the disease. Now I know you folks at the other end of the line already have this disease. So I wanna focus in particular on what needs to be done to deliver better care. But I think all of us should be proactive in creating a cleaner, world around us to stop the pandemic from developing any further and to protect our future generations. Um, and again, I'm referring to Ray Dorsey's presentation and of course to the book, which I hope you've read, um, which contains a lot of the materials. So how should we deal with this pandemic? I, I always like to sort of portray it as two parallel tracks. On the one hand, we need research into what happens in the brain, understanding of disease pathophysiology as a basis for innovative treatments to hopefully slow down the progression, one day stop the progression, and ultimately cure Parkinson's. The good news is that we are taking big steps. I think the insights into what's happening in the brain are better than ever before. We are closer than ever before to finding new treatments that hopefully at least may begin to slow down the progression of Parkinson's. I can't promise it will happen. You know, we've seen in the Alzheimer world one disappointment after the other. I'm sure you've seen the media hectic around the new drug that's been approved, which between us is, is madness. Um, I don't think the drug is working. Um, I have no idea why on earth the FDA is spending such a large amount of money on a drug that's ineffective, but anyway. And at the same time, I think the other parallel track is we need to do more research and implement better care models so that the millions of people in the world with Parkinson's receive the care that they deserve. And my own focus and my own work is mainly on the right. I just want to give you folks hope that a lot is happening in the left track as well. And that I hope that during my career, um, that I will witness the arrival of the first disease modifying treatment. I can't promise, but I'm hopeful. I just want to flag a paper, which gives me particular pride. I was invited by the Lancet to write a review paper on Parkinson's disease. This came out just a month ago <clears throat> in the prestigious journal, The Lancet. It's ultimately 20 pages in the Lancet, which is <laughs> incredible. And the two star figures I want to share with you here. This is so close to my heart. We often say that in the multidisciplinary team, there are no stars, uh, definitely not the neurologist, uh, nor any other of the medical professionals. There is one sun in the universe, and that is, the, that is you, the, per, the individual, the person living with this disease and your family and your beloved ones. So that's why in this universe, you are at the center as the sun, surrounded by your family, surrounded by a medical specialist and a nurse and a general practitioner. And then there are around 30 professional disciplines that are out there that can potentially help you now, this is not to say that all of these individuals will be involved, let alone at all time. It illustrates A, just what a complex disease Parkinson's is, because so many professional disciplines can become involved. And B, there is a significant amount of potential help out there, provided, but I will clarify that later in my talk, that these people understand their job. I think it is essential to have somebody who is passionate about Parkinson's and who understands this disease, which is so much different from all the other brain diseases. And that's what we've done in the Netherlands, and I'll share with that with you in a minute. But Dr. just, just Blum, let this, yeah, go ahead. Somebody wanted to know if the link to this article is still available. I know there was a free download at one point. Is there still one available? No, so I, I tell you, 
this is so frustrating. I told the Lancet, make this open access indefinitely. And they said, we can't. And I said, can I pay for it? How much do I need to pay? They said, we can't do it. It's against our journal policy. So it's behind the paywall. But Anissa, if I send you a PDF and we don't tell anybody outside this room that you have the PDF, then it's out of my hands. And if you then share, be my guest. How does that sound? Uh, I'm good with that. I think the audience would be I'm good with that. I've read this paper and it's amazing. It's very comprehensive. Thank you. I think, Else I think Elsevier is making enough money out of scientists and out of people with a disease like you. So we'll be sharing this. That's a promise. So, Thank you. And I think this image is just really very powerful. And the other important image is this one. I think the integrated care can be visualized as a table that rests on four legs. It's, of course, pharmacotherapy, the pills. It is the device-aided therapies, deep brain stimulation, intraduodenal lipidopa pump therapy or apomorphine pump therapy. It's multidisciplinary care. And it's you. It's you, well-informed, engaged, and active. That's why I enjoy evenings such as this so much, because it makes you better equipped to deal with this disease and to, to self-manage. Because I think the, the goal right on top of the table is the new definition of health. And the new definition of health is not the complete absence of any type of disease. It's the ability to participate in self-manage. And, and let this just sink in for a minute. It means that if you have one leg, but, but you can still walk around, then you're healthy. It means that if you, are, you have Parkinson's, but you find a way of dealing with the disease, supported by your spouse, by your children, by your family, by your friends, that is the goal in healthcare. I wish I could cure Parkinson's tomorrow. I can't. I can help you to participate in daily life and to self-manage. So that's the goal. And in medical care, we, we also published this paper in JAMA Neurology, which is one of the lead journals in neurology about how the COVID crisis, which I think has badly affected, in particular people with Parkinson's disease, has also taught us the importance of telemedicine, of delivering care right into your homes. So I come from the Netherlands. It's a huge country of 100 miles by 200 miles. You won't believe it. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit larger than New York. It's the whole country and it's densely populated. So in the Netherlands, we have the luxury that anybody can see a neurologist. But if you live in North Michigan, I know that it's very hard to find a neurologist and to physically see that person. But now telemedicine has come to the fore thanks to the crisis. And we now begin to understand that this is a good way of delivering care uh, right into your homes. I should say that there is a bit of a word of caution. I like telemedicine. I think it's a wonderful way of keeping you from traveling long distances to the hospital, waiting in the waiting room for donkey's years, only to see your physician for five or 10 minutes. And as you probably are better aware than I am, typically you will perform better in the hospital than you ever did at home. And, and you freeze in the parking lot, you know? So, I think the snapshot visits in the hospital are biased, but some very elite colleagues wrote a paper in the Movement Disorders Journal where they dissected my corpse and they said that I was overly optimistic about telemedicine. Uh, so there you see it, my corpse. And what these colleagues said, and I, I agree, is that you need the in-person visits to build up a warm relationship. So I never claimed that telemedicine should replace visits to the hospital. In my clinic, I like to touch my patients. I like to hug my patients. I sometimes cry with my patients. But once you've built up that intimate relationship, then you can use telemedicine for rapid follow-up visits, for a lab result, to check if the medication is still working, 
and to avoid the long distances to the hospital. And just to give you one example, we participated in an experiment in Northern Italy, where, as you may remember, in March last year, the COVID crisis started in Europe, in Northern Italy, where all these people were dying on the intensive care. And all the Parkinson doctors and all the Parkinson nurses were in the intensive care in Italy. So the patients in Italy with Parkinson's had nobody to go to. And a pharmaceutical company offered as a free service access to nurses who were complete strangers in the lives of these patients. And we've published about this experience. The patients said, we were so thankful that there was at least somebody to speak to, to whom we could address our questions, who could readily answer simple questions or tell us what to do if she couldn't. So yes, you need personal relationships. You need to see people to build up a relationship. But the Italy experience shows that if the alternative is nobody, a nurse through video conferencing <clears throat> can provide a lot of comfort and even camaraderie. And in my clinic, I even do end of life discussions now remotely. Um, just to clarify, I think a lot of people think that in the Netherlands, euthanasia is a common thing. I discuss it maybe once a week. In my active career, I've seen it once, just to put it in perspective. I discuss it every week. I've done it once. The Dutch have very strict regulation, very strict. All sorts of barriers and, and rules you have to abide to. But simply discussing end of life with patients and knowing that they will not choke, they will not die in pain, and that there is an alternative, provides them comfort. And just the knowledge that it's there is comforting. And I've done these discussions through telemedicine. And people say, but how can you do that in a video conference? Well, A, I'm not saying I should do it. It's, it was their wish. So I listen to my patients who I call the client. If the client says, I like it. But imagine if you talk about end of life and you do that in the hostile hospital environment, or you're sitting on your own sofa, holding the hand of your beloved one, I know what I would choose. So I'm just saying that telemedicine is bringing a lot of opportunities to deliver better care right into your home. And just quickly about what would my clients like? And Steve Jobs, as you know, really thought from the customer perspective. This is a paper from Canada uh, by Connie Maris. And she asked patients with Parkinson's how they felt about telemedicine. And what patients said is, we're interested but many said it's been, never been offered to me as an opportunity. And I think now, if you would redo it post COVID, I think the world has probably changed. And people said, and this is key, we like a combination, telemedicine and in-person visits. And people also felt the training of the nurses in the use of uh, telemedicine you know, was critically important. So maybe in closing, Digital medicine is not a panacea, um, it's a service. Um, but I want to really emphasize that in many parts of the world, being able to go to the hospital is a luxury item. People in Brazil, people in Africa, people in many parts of the United States simply have no access to a neurologist. And research has shown that if you do not have a neurologist, you're more likely to fracture your hip, end up in a nursing home, or die, period. So telemedicine is, in my perspective, it's a service. I, I see my role as a doctor in the hospital as a supermarket. I put products on the shelves. And you're the true client. If you like an in-person visit, and you live nearby the hospital, and you put that in your cart, will offer it. But if you live in North Michigan, far away from the hospital, and you put the telemedicine visit in your card, then we'll offer it. You know, true, the, the future of medicine is a personalized approach, 
shared decision making between you, your wishes and needs, and what we offer as a supermarket. I've once said in a tongue in cheek that ultimately clinicians will go out of job uh, because of digital technology. And obviously, I'm not serious. Uh, I do think that clinicians, and for that matter, scientists, because research will increasingly also become remote, who fail to integrate digital medicine into their practice, may at some point go out of business. Now, Anissa, I have just a few words about parking Sinet. Is there still time for that, or should we go to the discussion? No, I think it'll um, go along nicely with some of the questions which people are saying, do we need to move to the Netherlands? Because it seems like you have a lot of uh, things available to patients and families that are not available in the United States. Okay, well, I'll make people even more hungry when I tell them about <laughs> Parkinson Net. <clears throat> so Parkinson Net is a nationwide network in, in the Netherlands that we have built with three pivots. Instead of letting everybody do a little bit of the Parkinson cake, we have trained a limited number of professionals to become really good at Parkinson's care by training according to guidelines, by attending conferences, and by concentrating care among these experts. So we funnel the patients to these experts. So they treat a high caseload. So not only are they better because they're well-trained, they apply the knowledge in daily practice and become better and better and better in daily life. The second pillar is educating you. And I'll show that in a minute. I strongly believe that an empowered patient and an empowered family is happier and healthier. And finally, we strongly invest in promoting collaboration so that the left hand is knowing what the right hand is doing. And I think all of you know how frustrating it can be that your neurologist doesn't know what your physiotherapist is doing. The nurse has no clue. And we deeply invest in, in teamwork. So this is Holland. This is the huge country I told you about. Uh, we've trained 70 regional networks, over 3,000 professionals uh, who each now treat. So the physios in my country, as an example, used to treat one or two patients each year, period. Now they treat between 50 to 100 patients. So they become super troopers. And the patients, the moment they enter their practice, they feel it because they, they breed Parkinson's. They know their job. So they're trained according to guidelines. These are, by the way, they're all available in English. Um, and some of them also have lay versions. You can download them for free on this website. So that's gonna be interesting. And, and, and if this is going to quit, I'll share it with Anissa. We bring everybody together. We used to do that physically. Doesn't this look old fashioned right now, a, a Congress? But imagine, you know, we. We, we did the conference three weeks ago, completely online. We had two and a half thousand attending from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. And they attended right till the end. And they gave us an A plus for quality of the conference. So, and all these people are passionate about Parkinson's. They don't do one or two patients in between all the rest. This is their job. This is their mission. This is their life. We also connect them online. It's called Parkinson Connect. It's Facebook for healthcare, where they meet each other, discuss difficult cases, tell each other about recent papers, new breakthroughs. If I make a discovery that changes care tomorrow, I can put it in Parkinson Connect, reach out to the 3,000, and they will improve their business tomorrow. We have a healthcare finder. Anybody in the Netherlands can type their zip code. They can say, I want a speech language therapist. I want to travel 10 miles, not more. Search and Google Maps will give you an overview of people who you know are board certified by my team, trained in Parkinson's. Ed. You can review their faces. This is a beautiful example, good choice. You can see where they work. 
already see their facilities and book your appointment. And patients use this to build their own network and they are intro they're introducing. Isn't that beautiful? The other thing we do is Parkinson TV. Once every month, we broadcast live web-based television to our patients. There is always a patient at the table. It's like a talk show setting. We've now done 75 episodes, diet and Parkinson's, exercise and Parkinson's, genetics and Parkinson's. You name it, we've done it. It's a talk show setting. The patients decide about the topics, not we. There's always a patient at the table discussing with us. Patients either view us live or they watch missed episodes on the internet. We have done 12 episodes in the United States with Ray Dorsey, they're on YouTube. And the good news is we're gonna do 10 more this year. So we just got the grant. So there will be 10 more coming. Um, and this one is on diet, as you can see. Now, does it work? This is merely my final slide. We've published in the best journals in the world to show that this network approach leads to much better care, better adherence to guidelines. It leads to fewer disease complications and a better health for patients, including a 50% reduction in hip fractures in Holland. And it saves 30 million euros, about $35 million each year for Parkinson's care alone for a small country. So working in networks of experts understanding your disease leads to a better health and a lower price. And our latest research, this is Barack Obama, who used to say saving costs, saving lives. We're even saving lives. Mortality is going down in the Netherlands, which I think is incredible. Now, for that reason, there's a lot of interest around the world for building similar Parkinson nets. Um, there was one in California um, uh, with Kaiser Permanente. Um, this is my final slide. This is the Sagrada Familia, you know, the famous cathedral in Barcelona in Spain, which is beautiful, but this is only a part of the whole church. This is to signify that it's never ready. We have to keep building. We have to keep improving. We have to keep listening to your voice to make care better, patient-centered uh, and integrated. Uh, but at least we're taking the first step. So I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. All right, we've had some really good comments and questions. So I'm gonna go back to uh, one of the more recent ones just been in ask, um, it says Kaiser seems to have substantially withdrawn from implementing Parkinson care while several of your US partners are neurologists. My experience in the US is that PD generally is considered a nuisance by many US doctors. They just aren't as excited about ballet, classes, power, exercises, rock steady boxing that keep many of us functional. Have you observed this difference and what do you think we can do? Well, you know, I'm a strong believer in integrated care. And uh, I think the reason my colleagues for a long time have been critical or resilient or resistant to say boxing or dance is that there was a poor evidence base. I think a challenge for a clinician slash scientist like myself is to also build up a business case or a, sorry, an evidence base for these interventions. And the good news for you guys is that there is now increasingly good evidence for boxing, for dancing, for art therapy. This is not hocus pocus. This is now increasingly becoming an evidence-based treatment, um, thanks, to, thanks to scientific papers. And just, just before I forget, anything you do that gives you an aerobic workout works like a drug in suppressing your symptoms. And the latest work in my own group is suggesting that regular aerobic exercise may be the first way of slowing the progression of Parkinson's. And by exercise, I mean aerobic exercise. So anything that makes you pant, breathe a little bit faster, is the right dose. And do that at least three times a week 
for 30 to 45 minutes. You don't need to wear your pink spandex suit and work out like a horse, but you need to do something that makes you pant. And it doesn't matter whether you ride a bicycle, play basketball, brisk walking, or swimming, or a mix, do something you like, but stick to it. And if I may, and it's our latest research is using imaging. It shows that if you exercise by a minimum of three times a week, the brain starts to make new connections between the diseased basal ganglia and the cortex. So if you're sitting on your workout bicycle and you're thinking about quitting, you think, my brain is making new connections. Now, if that doesn't motivate you, I've done a bad job today. It's very true. So you um, talked a little bit about all the different professionals that's in your network. So someone wanted to know if that includes things like naturopaths, nutritionists, physical therapists, and even social workers. Who all do you include in that network? Yeah, the network currently includes uh, um, the slide was an old slide. It's, it's 19 disciplines already. The key ones in the core is physio, OT, speech and language, dietitian, and a social worker. These are, and the Parkinson nurse. Those are key. Those are the inner circle. And invariably, almost all patients will have to deal sooner or later with one of those folks. Then there's the outer circle, a rehabilitation specialist, a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, a urologist. And the list goes on and on, and you'll see the paper, I'll share it. And these are at your service if needed. But I think your team is incomplete without a physio, without a dietitian. Diet is critical. So you, you know, constipation is something that is plaguing almost every person with Parkinson's. Chronic constipation makes your drugs less effective. So without regular bowel movements, your drugs are likely to be ineffective or only partially effective. So make sure you have regular bowel movements. And if you're, if you're in doubt how to do it, ask your nurse, ask your dietitian, ask your GP, but you have to have regular bowel movements. So Netherlands is small, it's densely packed, and you've got a lot of resources. US is pretty big. <laughs> And there's a lot of areas that don't have access to the full team. They don't have a comprehensive center. Um, they may not even have a movement disorder specialist within a reasonable geographical area for them. Um, what is the best thing that people can do to get that same team approach so that they can optimize their quality of life if they don't have a center that has all of those players. Yeah, so um, we now have quite a bit of experience in bringing Parkinson to other countries, also much less densely populated countries. And there's a number of models. Uh, one of course is telemedicine. I think ideally a physiotherapist comes to see you and touches you, but it is, well, it may be second best, but it's still much better than nothing if the physiotherapist coaches you and supervises you remotely. The key is find a physio who's doing that more often. So if you have a Parkinson-like approach, you could still have a physiotherapist far away supervising many patients through telemedicine remotely. Um, that's one option. The, the other option is that you find a regular therapist nearby who then consults with the super trooper therapist who is more remote. So now you have your physiotherapist nearby who may not understand the latest of the latest, but who is coached or supervised by the more experienced super trooper who is part of the network and works more remotely. That's the model we've implemented in Norway, and that seems to be working very well. And it's very helpful, and you've mentioned this earlier, for people to be educated and engaged. And of course, the people on here are falling into that you know, criteria, but there's a lot of people that 
are out there in the United States and in other countries that don't have an awareness of resources like PMD Alliance and other organizations that do education. So, you know, from your perspective, what can we do to help reach? Because the more they know, the more they can advocate to get, if, especially if they live in an area, they don't have all of these uh, resources, they can ask the questions, where can I go? They can start searching for them if there's not a database where it's all easily accessed for them. So what would you say to help get people to the resources they need? Right, well, the, um... There is a lot of information out there. I think many, many patients will complain that it is a bit scattered. Um, but I think if I look at the United States, the Parkinson's Foundation is doing a tremendous job in giving good information. The Michael J. Fox Foundation is a wonderful resource of information. And you folks are, you, you're not patients, that's one. You know, In my Lancet paper, I consistently speak of individuals or persons, that's one. You're also advocates. You are the more proactive front runners. So I think what our book is saying is we as a community, as a Parkinson community, should become way more proactive. We've been too silent. We should bark up the tree. Parkinson's is environmentally driven. Parkinson's is a horrible disease or can be a horrible disease. And, but it's a treatable disease. We need more money to find solutions. So I'm counting on all of you to raise your voice. And I think the Parkinson community has been too passive. I, I, I often say, you know, I love my job because people with Parkinson's are truly, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, are among the nicest people on the planet. But maybe you folks are too nice. You're too friendly and you're too passive. You know, the HIV community chained themselves to the front doors of pharmaceutical industries and demanded better treatment and better care and more money. And HIV has changed from a deadly condition into a chronic treatable disease. I think the time is now here uh, to raise awareness. And by raising awareness, hopefully people will find their way to, for example, the Parkinson's Foundation for information. I think you should all become a member of the Parkinson's Foundation or another related organization because the more people are members the stronger their voice you know we are with seven million on this planet if we bundle forces people have to hear us uh, join the pd avengers a rock steady gal thank you i'm not sure where rocks who is rock steady gal that's a good point join the pd avengers i'm a pd avenger myself so that's a great great suggestion i forgot that sorry um, Dr. Bloom, the book talks about cancer's model for treatment based on individual characteristics, more of a personalized approach. And I know you've spoken on this before. Could you talk a little bit about that in the future of Parkinson treatment being from a personalized perspective? There's a number of developments ongoing. So people tend to think that personalized medicine means um, sequencing your DNA and tailoring your pharmacotherapy to your DNA profile. And that is a part of personalized medicine and that will happen. Uh, another part of personalized medicine, which is also more remote is testing for specific genes. And if you have GBA Parkinsonism, you will receive different treatments from a person who has LARC2 Parkinsonism. That's still a promise I think it will change in the next five to maybe 10 years. But personalized medicine is also listening to your individual needs and priorities. And that can happen today. So what I tell all my patients is there are maybe 10, 20, 30 things you'd like to see improved. You know, Parkinson's is a difficult disease. But before you go to your clinic, think carefully look into the mirror, speak to your wife or your husband and draw your top three or better even draw your top two or better even draw your top one. And then go to your physician and say, this is what I want to improve. So they had little time 
So if you empty your bucket with your 20 problems, you know what happens? Your physician is paralyzed. Nothing happens. Give your physician or your nurse one problem. And the next time you move to number two on your list, but do one thing, do it properly, solve it, crack the nut and move on to number two on your list. So that is personalized medicine because for, for Joan, I'm just picking you as an example, it may be sleep. For Judy, it may be constipation. For Wes, it, it might be his gait. You know, Parkinson's is personalized and your wishes and needs and priorities, but you're the one that should dictate what happens in the clinic. All right, we had a question from Jim. He said, environmentally driven, does the neurological community at large agree? Will this affect the future of research into treatments? Uh, you know, Jim, I think the evidence in favor of an environmental cause is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. If you look at, for example, France, if Parkinson's was not environmentally driven, Parkinson's should be equally spread across France. It should be like a porridge where each bite tastes the same. Instead, in France, you see pockets. There's a lot of Parkinson's in the Bordeaux area. There's a lot of Parkinson's in the Provence, but very little Parkinson's in the cities. And the map of Parkinson's overlaps with rural areas and wine industry. It's the same in the United States. It's the same in Canada. Parkinson's did not exist prior to 1817 when environmental pollution started. So Jim, the, I think the scientific community is now convinced. The problem is to convince industry. There are huge economic interests involved. Your country, the United States is still using Paraquat today. Paraquat is the most toxic damn compound on the planet. One sip will kill you. It's been banned even in China and you're using it today and it's just been extended. It's madness. Yeah. If you give Paraquat to a mouse, knocks out the substantia nigra and the mouse becomes Parkinsonian. And you're spraying it on your fields. And the, the thing is the Paraquat persists in the environment. A tractor drives across the dust. It evaporates and you breathe it again. So it's, it's horrible. Um, I see somebody say China manufactures paraquats. That, that's, I mean, I'm not saying China are saints. Uh, I think the United States is crazy with all respect. When it comes to paraquat, I think it's a bloody shame, frankly. I think Donna has her hand raised. You can unmute yourself, Donna. Yes, I just wanted to ask about uh, the availability. When I read about the watches that were available to manage Parkinson's symptoms, the Apple Watch and the, um, the one that was used in the Netherlands, Verify Life Sciences. And it kind of collects all the symptoms. And I, I know that when you have your 15 minutes with your doctor, they don't have time to review all that information. But this is like taking your control into your own hands and managing your own symptoms through the watch and creating individualized medicine. But it was introduced in 2018 and I haven't heard of it in Pittsburgh till I read the book. Yeah. Well, so why uh, has no, it been used? Yep. That's a great question, Donna. And um, I think um, we're, we're, we're close to implementing this, fairly close. Um, you have to understand that building the, so a watch can collect truckloads of data. The very smart watch that we use in my research uh, is a handsome watch. It's easy to use. People wear it 24 seven. There's a long battery life. It gives you insights into how people function at home. But the challenge is twofold, building reliable algorithms that are not just a digital signal, but that also makes sense and say something about what matters to you. So translating the digital signal into a meaningful value that says something about your wishes and needs, that's still a bridge that needs to be, a gap that needs to be bridged. I think it takes probably three to five years before we are there. And second, 
that information somehow needs to end up in a dashboard in a digestible fashion for you, but also for your physician. So in my ideal world, you measure yourself. The nurse or the doctor sees it and intervenes proactively when you see things going awry. So it's, it's under construction. Uh, we are getting there, but it's in, at this point still research. So keep an eye open and we'll tell you when, when it's there. We'll, we'll get there, but it takes a little bit more time. Thanks. We had a comment, um, reminds me of this quote, science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. <laughs> huh. Well, I have little to add to that. That's a beautiful <laughs> quote. So what, what would you say to our participants today that we can do individually to make a difference? Um, what advice do you have? Because it is frustrating that you know, other countries have banned Paraquat, we're still using it. There's chemicals that are in our environment now that we know are tied to Parkinson's. What, what can we do? I mean, we, we've we done the red letters, you know, give a dime, not damn, give a dime. Um, what more can we do? Um, I think join, join one of the associations in your country, the larger the numbers the better it is. I think um, uh, what Rocksteady Gal was saying is join the PD Avengers. They're a powerful movement. Um, and I think if we bundle our, our voices and all become less passive, I think we, we, we can turn the needle. Uh, there are so many patients with Parkinson's, but again, we've been too friendly and too passive. So join larger associations and, and, and raise your voice. In the meantime, exercise regularly, make sure you have regular bowel movements and stay optimistic. You know, it, it, it's a tough disease, but I think optimism uh, also helps in, in, in dealing with this condition better. All right, and Roxetti Gal um, says, what advice, not just about advocacy, but about living well? And she said, well, you kind of answered that. Um, <laughs> You no, actually it's, it's, had a video. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was no, going to say, you no. actually had a video um, that I saw that maybe others have where uh, you had, I think, a, a gentleman that was coming to see you as a patient and he rode his bike to clinic, but had severe gait issues and freezing, um, but was able to get on and off that bike and ride it to and from his appointments. And I think that speaks highly of the impact of exercise. Yes, absolutely. And um, um, I, I, I thought you were also going to refer to the video I did of From God to Guide. Yes, and I am. Yeah. I was actually gonna bring that up next because that's a great video yeah. about just the, the role of the person with the diagnosis of being engaged and being a participant in care and the physician being a partner with them. Could you share a little bit about that? Because it, probably a few people in here may not have even heard of that video. Well, it's it, just very briefly. It, I, I, I think the video is 10 years old and I think the world is, is, is changing, but I still think that sometimes physicians see themselves as God instead of a guide or a coach, I think my role as a neurologist is to give you good information so that you can make the best decision yourself based on the feedback and the intel that I give you. So in that video, I start my consultation as if I'm God. I start in a, in a forklift, which is raised to 10 feet height, accompanied by the singing of angels, <laughs> the light coming from the ceiling. And ultimately, the patient says, I don't like this. And he hits a reset button. And the angel stops singing. The light goes off. I come down, take off my white coat, sit down with the patient. We have a cup of coffee and talk about what matters to him. And so in eight minutes, it's a TED talk. You see me change from God into a guide, a coach. And I think you deserve coaches that give you information so that you can make the best decisions yourself. You, know, you want to take things in, into your own hands. The, the one thing that always strikes me in, when you have a chronic disease is you're uncertain. Uncertain about the future, uncertain 
what will happen to you or to your family. And the more you know, and the more you can do yourself, including exercise, including a healthy diet, the better it is. There's a question by Ashenka, which I could cover about digital literacy and tech skills. And Ashenka, you're right. So I think one reason to be still a bit cautious about telemedicine is the digital divide. And not everybody understands this. I think that on the positive side, what we have learned from the crisis is that a surprising proportion of also elderly people can deal with telemedicine. And don't forget, telemedicine is also simply a telephone. So I think video conferencing is overrated. Simply being able to hear a voice and to reach out by telephone is already helpful. Um, and we've also learned that people who cannot operate a computer typically have a cousin or a neighbor or a friend who can help them. So to stop developments from happening because we're concerned about the digital divide is not the right thing to do. I think we should make sure that those people who cannot operate computers receive the support that they deserve. And I did put the video link in for the YouTube for God or Guide. Um, it was a yeah. TED Talk. All right, Jim wrote in, damage caused by chronic exposure to toxins can be stopped or reversed in some cases, heart, lungs, and liver. Do the parts of the brain affected by neurodegenerative diseases respond this way? No, I wish. So all we know is that exposure to all these chemicals are associated, very likely causally associated with the risk of developing the disease. Whether limiting your exposure to these toxins when you have the disease is any beneficial, we simply don't know. But I tell all my patients, eat biological when you can afford it. If you can't, wash your fruit and vegetables carefully. I can tell you, I was on Dutch television twice last week because a journalist self-funded took 60 samples in three big Dutch supermarket chains. 57% of the samples in Dutch supermarkets 2021 contained pesticides. And they had three bottles of French red wine and all three contain Roundup, which I think is, this is 2021 in the Netherlands. So be aware of what you eat, be aware of what you drink, because I suspect that if you already have Parkinson's and if you're continuing to be exposed to pesticides, it will worsen your disease. I don't know, it's never been studied, but I think you should eat well, particularly when you've got the disease. And they do come out every year with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, which are the fruits and vegetables that are either more laden with pesticides or the safer ones. Um, and do you find that to be a good guide, Dr. Bloom? That's not a, a Dutch a habit. Not a Dutch thing. Easily, <laughs> no, not a Dutch thing, but I can easily see how that would be helpful. Uh, but I would still urge people to be very cautious and critical of what they eat and, and wash it very carefully. Um, well water in the United States is probably unsafe or can be unsafe. Regulations are less tight. So use a, a, a filter if you, if you drink well water. Um, those are very helpful things. Trying to avoid head trauma, uh, which may promote Parkinson's. And, and the latest research is again emphasizing the importance of air pollution. So whatever you can do to avoid that is, is also helpful probably. All right. Well, what we've been doing in all of our book clubs is drawing a couple of names from our participants to be winners of a signed copy of the book. So we do have two winners for today. That's Ellen Schaefer and Robbie Cordish. 
So if you are still online, if you would be willing to message Kelly Merkel, um, or you can email us at info at pmdalliance.org, we will make sure that we have your correct information so that we can send you your copy of your signed book. Um, we only have one more minute left. Um, and while we don't have the Parkinson net here in the United States, um, PMD Alliance does have some aspects of uh, their resources available on our website. So I just wanted to really quickly share, just so you know where you can go if you're searching for some information. So I don't know if you can share, see my screen, but if you go to our website under our resources, you'll find that you can look for support groups, exercise groups, find a clinician, treatment options. And there's also links here. So you can find, you know, medical network, you can go to your team and find movement disorder specialists and advanced practice providers and therapists. We have exercise groups listed. <clears throat> we have a uh, certified Parkinson's disease facility. So these are assisted living facilities that have taken uh, special certification to understand Parkinson's disease, um, a list of national local resources, as well as information on medication, medication assistance programs, and videos that explain what each medication is and what it does. So that's a resource that we offer, um, even though we don't have the thorough website like the Parkinson Net. Um, Dr. Bloom, it's been wonderful having you on. Um, it's been wonderful having this opportunity to discuss this book, which has just been amazing. I've really enjoyed reading it. I know the audience has really enjoyed very much reading it and just talking to the authors, just having the ability to discuss with you, you know, what is going on and why you chose this content. I don't know if you have any last words that you would like to share with the, with the audience today. This is, this is for me? Yes. Yeah, any last words uh, of wisdom for our audience before we close up for the day? Um, I think it is, <clears throat> what I'll end is, is by saying it, it, it is a time of hope. You know, if you, if you read the Lancet paper, I can't promise, but I think awareness of Parkinson's as a common and fast growing disease is growing. Um, I think Parkinson's is on the agenda now, more so than 10 years before. I think the insights are growing. We're developing better treatments. The worldwide Parkinson community is working well together, which I find gratifying. For example, the field of multiple sclerosis is hugely divided. Parkinson researchers are nice people in general. I have many friends in the field and we collaborate really well. So I think this is a time of hope. It's a time of hope for you people. And I can't deliver, you know, but I, I, I can't promise what I can't deliver, but I, I, people are working. I work around the clock. I mean, I know many other people are working around the clock and I just wish and hope that we will soon have something more tangible for you guys to offer. I, and I think it's real. So, so keep hope is, is my main message, and which is a real hope. Well, I really want to thank you for joining us because I know it's late in the Netherlands right now, and I appreciate you giving your time and your expertise. It's been wonderful. I know our audience appreciated it. So if everyone would be willing to do the grave of what the wave of gratitude to Dr. Bloom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all of your expertise, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.